I saw an article uh, just last night, and it's it's from Powerline. Safe from the sign of the cross. And it's speaking about, we're shifting topics here. Uh, it's speaking about the public spaces protection order in the United Kingdom. And we're starting to see similar types of things here in the United States as well. But there's this sign and it marks off basically all of downtown in a particular uh, city. Um, this is Bournemouth. And it says the following activities are prohibited Monday to Friday between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Protesting, namely engaging in an act of approval or disapproval or attempted act of approval or disapproval with respect to issues relating to abortion services by any means. This includes, but is not limited to graphic, verbal, or written means, prayer or counseling. So from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in this zone, um, this safe zone, what are you safe from? Someone praying. Now, here in the United States, at least those of us who have been around for a while, we sort of have it ingrained upon us that this kind of tyranny, that this is tyranny because it's a denial of our free speech rights. But we must realize, of course, that this at one point had been free a society that had really ever been known because of a recognition of the origin and source of human rights. They're not to be found in written documents. They are found in the created order around us as it has been ordered by God. And as we have rejected that foundation, we now see as a result the inevitable uh, abandonment and rejection of those very foundations and hence those rights such as free speech. But it is an amazing thing to think about calling something a safe zone when in reality it is a, a no rights zone. It is a death zone. When you are afraid of people praying, you have capitulated to the culture of death and the result is inevitable. And so, uh, when you, when you look at what's going on in Europe and what people want to have happening here and what they will promote if they are given, you know, if they are given any, any opportunity whatsoever to overthrow freedom of religion, freedom of speech, they, they will do it. They, they have absolutely no qualms whatsoever. The left is, the, the leftists in the United States are just as radical as the leftists that brought about the Bolshevik revolution and everything else. They're, they're the same people, the same mindset, and it will have the same results, just multiplied many times over as far as the number of deaths. But the, the insane depths to which these people will go to protect the sacrament of the secular culture of death, that being the murder of unborn children, and now the exposure of born children to uh, drag queens and grooming and uh, uh, mutilation of their bodies so they can never have children and have much shorter lives. It's all part of the culture of death. It's all related, directly related, all of it together. There's no, no way around that. In the midst of all this, we have heard over and over again that there is 
one group that stands firm, and that is the Roman Catholic Church. The very phrase, culture of death, came from a pope. And there is no doubt that Roman Catholicism was much earlier on the uptake in regards to abortion than Protestants were. I mean, most people didn't even know what the what it was all about. And it, it has been admitted that prior to 1973, there were lots of Southern Baptists. The Southern Baptist Convention itself seemingly was in support of abortion rights, but no one knew really what, had never really thought it through, and the Roman Catholics had. And so for a lot of folks, it's been like, well, you know, there's, there's one group that will always stand firm. And I just go, really? What, um, what causes, what could possibly, what foundation could be provided that would stand firm with anything coming at it? Anything we see in this world. It is not tradition. Even the Roman Catholic tradition. And if you want to see a good example of this, and this is, this is going to tie into a lot of what we have to say today. You see, tradition is not the preservation of a consistent objective truth over time. When you look at the development of tradition in church history, what you see are fits and starts and bumps and dead ends that could have been different. The, the dead ends could have been where the road ended up going, but didn't historically. And what you see is a change in development over time. Again, this was not, at least amongst Protestants, believing Protestants, a um, disputable issue until just recently. Once Protestants started elevating tradition and redefining tradition, things like that. But we recognized that, for example, uh, Wycliffe. There's a great, there's a great um, video. Uh, we played it a number of times on New Year's Eve over the years. It's a great video. Wycliffe, I think it's called Wycliffe, the Morning Star of the Reformation, something like that. And one of the scenes, or a couple of the scenes in the in the video, portrayed Wycliffe recognizing how the teaching of the church and not, and and not all that long ago. He recognized that the doctrine of substantiation was a doctrine that had been unknown only a few hundred years before his own time. That was a very dangerous thing to recognize. But the development of tradition over time is well, well documented. And so what happens is you. You will get certain individuals, Augustine being sort of the prototypical example of this, but certain individuals who have a really outsized influence on the generations and centuries after them. And they are imperfect individuals, and we may we may honor them and we may think that they did a lot of great things, but you know, the fact of the matter is they weren't perfect. And a number of times, historically, it was the errors that they made that became elevated on the basis of their own personal accomplishments and name and become incorporated into, quote, Christian tradition, end quote, even though their conclusions or their understandings were erroneous. And... The result over time is a movement of the center point of that tradition. It is not merely the constant guarding 
of a historically same tradition. We have a modern illustration that just came out. The Catholic News Agency has this uh, headline. Pope Francis appoints pro-abortion economists to Pontifical Academy for Life. The Pontifical Academy for Life. Mariana Mazzucato is the pro-abortion economist. Washington, D.C., October 18th. This was two days ago. One of the newest members of, of the Pontifical Academy for Life, appointed by Pope Francis, is an outspoken advocate of abortion rights, having recently shared her opposition to the overturning of Roe v. Wade on Twitter. Italian-American economist Mariana Musicato, known for her work promoting the public sector's role in encouraging innovation, was among seven academics appointed by the Pope on October 15th to serve five-year terms with the Academy. In his 2020 book, Let Us Dream, The Path to a Better Future, Pope Francis described Mizzicato's work as, quote, thinking that is not ideological, which moves beyond the polarization of free market capitalism and state socialism, and which has at its heart a concern that all of humanity have access to land, lodging, and labor. The website Catholic Culture published on Tuesday links to recent social media posts shared by Mazzucato in which she tweeted and retweeted pro-abortion statements concerning the Supreme Court's decision to return abortion law to the states. In response to a Twitter post that featured commentary deploring the overturn of Roe v. Wade, Mazzucato tweeted, so good. The post included a video of commentator Anna Kasparian condemning Christians for pushing their own views on non-Christians. I listened to it. It was just pathetic. Uh, classic example of what you could use to talk about Christian worldview issues. Um, and so uh, Robert P. George, professor of jurisprudence at Princeton University, a Catholic and outspoken advocate for the right to life, told CNA that he is disturbed by the news the appointment the Pontifical Academy for Life exists to advance the church's mission to foster respect for the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family, beginning with the precious child in the womb. Either one believes in this mission or one does not. If one does not, then why would one wish to be part of the Pontifical Academy? George asked. And why would someone with appointment authority appoint someone to the Academy? I can think of no explanation that is not shocking and scandalous, George told CNA. And then there's a bunch of stuff she's tweeted, again, um against uh, Roe v. Wade and uh, overturning so on and so forth. And this is also interesting. The Pontifical Academy for Life was formed by St. John Paul II in 1994 with a pro-life mission to study information and formation on the principal problems of biomedicine and of the law relative to the promotion and defense of life, above all the, the direct relation that they have with Christian morality and the directives of the Church's magisterium. The Academy's first president, Venerable Jerome Lejeune, established bylaws requiring members of the Academy to sign a declaration stating, quote, Before God and men, we bear witness that for us every human being is a, per is a person, and that from the moment that the embryo is formed until death, it is the same human being which grows to maturity and dies. In 2016, however, with the appointment of Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia as president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, Pope Francis approved new statutes that eliminated the requirement that members declare themselves pro-life. However, the Academy's new statutes still require members to conform with church teaching. Well, <laughs> I, I would make a pretty strong argument personally uh, that Pope Francis does not conform to church teaching. But then again, he's the Pope. And there's your problem. Because as long as you have the idea that the Pope is the final arbiter of all these things, then the Pope gets to determine what church teaching is anyway. See, the Roman system has all these uh, academies and, you know, the Pontifical Biblical Commission and all the rest of this kind of stuff that has tremendous weight and authority and impact. 
over Roman Catholic institutions and, and things like that. And the Pope gets to assign people. And everybody knows that Francis has been uh, elevating to the position of cardinal men who have his views of theology and the world, which are very leftist, socialist, liberation theology, um, way left of center stuff. And so how many popes does it take to have a fundamental impact? I mean, let's just think, what if after Ratzinger, Boniface XVI, uh, you had three more pontificates of conservative, Ratzinger-esque, or, or even more conservative, popes. And then let's say, let's compare that with, let's say we have two more, at least two more, Francis-style popes. Because there's a really good chance. I mean, he's filled the College of Cardinals with his own sycophants, his own mirror images. So who are they going to vote for as far as the next pope? Should he re die or, as he very well could, resign? Go three popes down those two roads, and do you have the same body of teaching? No, you don't. You've now had years and years and years of diverging teaching and application of fundamental aspects of what Roman Catholicism would identify as the Christian faith. This is how tradition changes over time. And we are watching a situation where anybody with a scintilla of honesty knows that the current Pope does not positively affirm and believe so much of what was affirmed and believed by Popes 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago. And so when someone says, well, Rome will always stand firm on issues of human sexuality, abortion, marriage. How do you know that? If Pope Francis, knowingly, not out of ignorance, but knowingly, can appoint to something called the Pontifical uh, Institute for Life, whatever it was here, I'm looking for it, um, pro-life mission, um, knowingly put people on this in this group that are not pro-life, that have supported sentiments of abortion rights and, and things like that. If that can happen now, then why can't it happen in why can't in the next the next pope? Uh, why can't the next pope push that even farther and push that even farther and push that even farther? And if you if you try to push back, and if you try to say, well, but that's but that's wrong. How can that be? This is the very essence of my point. When you do not have an objective. Sorry, the camera's uh, shot off on me. And I sort of like to have the cameras running. Um, be able to see what's uh, going on out there. There we go. I figured that that truck could not have been sitting at the corner quite as long as it had been. <laughs> it was frozen in place. Sorry about that. A little distracting, but hey, we have a WEF mayor in Phoenix, and so we've become Los Angeles East, so... You have to keep an eye on things. Um, this is the problem when you do not have sola scriptura. Tradition 
develops over time, including within Roman Catholicism. And if you've just been sitting back going, ah, oh, well, you know, at least the at least the Catholics will always be be there to hold the line. Really? Really? You sure about that? Um I don't I don't think that's I don't think that's the case. 